All right, welcome back to the House Committee on Government Operations and Military Affairs. Uh, we are continuing our work on the Vermont Criminal Justice Council uh, miscellaneous uh, recommendations bill. And I want to um, start off uh, our testimony uh, this afternoon um, because I know he is very crunched for time. Um, Chief uh, Maurice Lamoff of the St. Albans PD has agreed to um, give us a little feedback. Uh, I think he's having a little trouble with the Zoom, though, potentially. Oops. Yeah. Give it just a minute here and see if Chief Lamoth can get back on. Hey, Chief, can you hear us okay? Like, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. Every time I tried to unmute, it was kicking me out. But yes, I can hear you. Hello. All right. Great. Thanks uh, so much for agreeing to uh, spend a few minutes with us. I know you have a really busy day, so I wanted to get you right in as we're picking up our work again on this bill. Um, I mostly had asked, uh, we've been talking uh, for the past few weeks as we've looked at this about um, kind of the modernizing training standards uh, yes. for law enforcement certification and moving from, you know, having a, you got to do so many hours for this and so many hours for that to uh, skills, demonstration of skills and competency base. Um, and, you know, with your experience as a trainer and a law enforcement leader, wanted to kind of get your feedback on, on that principle overall uh, and this bill specifically, if you had a chance to read the draft that I'd sent you. Yes, I have. Um, so one of the challenges that I didn't realize, to be honest with you, as much when I was with the state police, because a lot of the things there are kind of um, laid out for you, even in a leadership role and a commander role. But when I came here, uh, the police department as the chief, particularly, one of the challenges we have is finding adequate training and then finding the time to do it. So what I what I do appreciate is when stuff is pushed down to the criminal justice training council and then mandated for us to do and is supplied for us. So. Um, any training that is done uh, that is pushed out by legislature by the state is going to be in a mandated type scenario um if it's mandated through the training council and then pushed to us like the domestic violence for example is perfect we know it's coming they 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 select the training they devise the training um they adapt they adapt the training at their level they push it to us and whether it's yearly or every other year and then as a department head it's very easy for us to make sure it gets done um and i think that's the best way moving forward to get them to get mandatory training that we find applicable to our our profession and we can ensure that it gets done on our level and chief um i probably should have done this i kind of dove in asking you a question right off the bat but could you just introduce yourself for the record and um, talk about your experience in law enforcement and just broadly. <laughs> uh, yeah, so my name is Morris Lamoth. I've um, been doing this for almost 25 years. Uh, the first uh, 20, oh, just under 21 years, I was with the Vermont State Police, uh, mostly in the northern part of the state. And I concluded my career as a station commander, commander of the St. Albans Barracks. Um, and I left there in 2019. I retired. Um, I was retired for about a week and a half, and I ended up um, down here at the St. Albans Police Department. For the first eight months or so, I was the director of dispatch. And um, eight months after I started here, I became the interim chief of police and have since been the, the standing police chief for the last almost uh, three years. So any questions? <laughs> Great. Um, so... Uh, Chief, I think the, the conversation that we had had this morning, um, we had spoken with both uh, the Criminal Justice Council um, and a couple of representatives from IADList uh, who, um, you know, set training standards and develop curricula um, and certify uh, trainings. And I'm just wondering if you uh, could talk a little bit about um, how training has evolved. One of the things that we were really focused on was there was some language in statute that was created, you know, uh, six or seven years ago, I think that said by 2018, all law enforcement in the state has to have uh, at least four hours of fair and impartial policing training by December 31st, 2018. 
Um, part of what this bill does is it strikes that specific re requirement and then talks more broadly about demonstrating competency. So I'm, in light of that, there's been a little bit of a concern about getting rid of the, the specific number of hours, even though that's kind of an old number. I'm just wondering if, if you have any perspective on kind of the evolution of fair and impartial police training and what the officers at agencies like the St. Albans Police Department see in terms of fair and impartial police training every couple of years. So fair and impartial police training, yeah, it has evolved. So I'm sorry, so that wasn't even really a, a, a topic when I started in the 90s. So um, it's becoming more of a, a continuous topic because that evolves as well. And, I, and along with a lot of the other topics that we're trained on. And as far as like, the way it's it's laid out, it, when it, it started, just like many topics with training, when I started, um, it all started with every time a topic became um, it came to the forefront that it became known that police departments weren't either one weren't being trained on it at all, or two weren't being trained consistently across the state. You know, larger departments were usually ahead of the smaller departments. Um, it became more of a mandatory training where it wasn't suggested anymore that hey, your every department should have this, or or even ex or even thought that they did. It became uh, mandatory. Uh, every department was still on its own to figure out how to get roll those trainings out, and it was difficult for the smaller departments to find time or funding. And then, you know, fair and partial being the same thing, and even then, you didn't know what the competency level was of those trainings. It could have been a three-minute speech by a commander or a supervisor, and that could have been it, or a one-hour online training or with no testing. Um, and then a lot of the online trainings, it was just you could let, let it play in the background, whatever you're doing, and that was enough to do it, even if you didn't read a single word. Um, then it became uh, the state police started using um, trainings that were timed, so you know you at least had to be looking at it, or there were tests at the end, which was you know the, the way to go. So at least you knew you were getting something out of it. And slowly trainings evolved more and more to where, like I said, we're seeing a lot more mandatory trainings that are devised by the Criminal Justice Training Council, and they're either Zoom-based or it's even some that's sent out that is, has a test at, at the end of it. And I think that's where the evolution has come and is still going that way. Um, it's still very difficult, like I said, for departments to devise or locate, or even, even if the money is there, to find training that isn't sent by the state of Vermont. Representative Morgan has a question. Yes. Hey, good afternoon, Chief Michael Morgan here from uh, Milton. So you've We've got uh, one of your residents is our chief in Milton, Steve LaRush. I'm sure you speak yeah. with him from time to time. But um, anyway, Chief, um, so if I hear you correctly, it sounds like to me you're 100% on board. You've read this bill. You like what you see. Sounds yes. like what you're conveying to us, correct? I am. I mean, like I said, it's we spend, we have a couple of people here that devise most of our training. Like every agency probably has a, a team of, a group of, or even a single person. And we spend a lot of time um, trying to find trainings per, per, uh, especially towards um, fair and impartial, um, equality, um, bias-free policing. We spent a lot of time trying to find a time train, find, finding training in this area, meaning Vermont National, um, that is designed specifically for officers in that realm. And it's very, very difficult. So anything you can do at the state level um, to help with that. And if it comes from Vermont Criminal Justice Council, it's easy for us to push it out. It's easy for us to justify. It's easy for us um, if we're called to the carpet per se uh, to say, where are you getting this training? Why are you using this specific training? It's nice for us to fall back on that and say, we are tra all trained the same in the state of Vermont. And this is where it came from. Excellent. We appreciate it. Follow on to that then. And it sounds like, so that you all as a general whole, sounds like as law enforcement um, leadership in the state are pretty much on board with the CJC's uh, um, that connection or that uh, I'm trying to think of, I'm, the words are escaping here that that agenda. Agenda, yeah, yeah I guess agenda or the means of operation how that filters down to you all and how that training gets conducted you're on board with that process I believe I heard you say it, it works yeah well. I mean it works well. I, you know, I've dealt with the Criminal Justice Training Council. I was a trainer down there, I'm an instructor down there, a training, uh, certified instructor down there for years. Um, there are certainly critiques you can make of the Criminal Justice Training Council. However, if you look at the big picture and realize that they're playing into a lot of different, uh, a lot of different people are pushing for them to put their own agendas on what we're supposed to learn, what they want us to learn. But you only have so many hours to train new officers coming out. 
Mm-hmm. That is a fact. You, know, you only have so many weeks to get them pushed out into the world. Then it becomes incumbent on the on the individual agencies they're going to to expand their training. So that's where that's just as important as your initial academy time. So that's where I think the academy could get better, and they are getting better at pushing out these mandatory trainings and these consistent trainings. So again, every officer in the state is getting trained the same because, uh, as we all know, liability is huge in this world and especially in this profession. And when we're called out on something, we say, "Hey, we this is the latest training that was offered." we took it we were proficient in it because this testing was done it showed we read it we went through it we tested and and this is what we learned um so at least we have that as as a chief's perspective anyway in the city's perspective we at least have done what we could to train our officers um with the most up-to-date information thanks for that perspective chief appreciate it representative hanko thank you um chief i have a question about um the transition period as the cjc is going from a prescribed number of hours to competency-based testing and training training and testing how how do you feel about um that interim period where you may or may not know exactly i mean i have not gotten an answer from them how they are going to prescribe what an officer needs for training because it's quote unquote in the process of being decided on. How are you going to feel when you have officers who are coming due for training and you're not really sure what they're actually going to need because it's not going to be written in statute what they need? Yeah, that so that this conversation here in the and hearing from um uh, Mr. McCarthy, yesterday was the first I've heard of that being discussed. So I don't know. That's that's a great question because we can't hear from them in December that you know you didn't meet your 30 hours and us thinking that it's going to be competency based and all of a sudden we have to come up with these hours in a month for every officer we have. That's not going to work. So um, in our eyes, in our world, I'd rather see them keep a number um, and then come up with their competency based and give us a year to transition into that um, so we can do it unless those competency based uh, trainings are going to equate to enough hours so that it can overlap and you're still going to break the 30 hour thresh threshold um, because right now that is the number we've been looking at since i got here and in the state police and um that's the number we balance everything on we we organize our trainings right now in january we start looking at the year and laying it out so that we'll break the, that th- we'll, we'll minim- minimally hit 30 hours per officer over the course of the entire year. So it doesn't hurt us as far as staffing hours and budgetary um, use uh, to make sure we hit it. So again, it it's gonna be a transition that hopefully they give us some time uh, to look ahead so that we don't get crunched at the end of the year. Thank you. Because yeah. staffing wise, if we have to all of a sudden pay everybody to hit training at the same, in the same sure. month. Yeah, Chief, I think the, the idea, um, as we've heard it in testimony from the Criminal Justice Council and um, some of the the folks that are helping them continuously improve the curriculum there is to try and make sure that the hours that are are being spent aren't just checking off the box but are are more efficiently helping your officers get to the place where they can demonstrate competency um so we're definitely not going to increase the total number of hours but on specific um on specific uh, things like fair and partial policing and a ride training, here we're basically giving uh, pushing on the a ride piece uh, flexibility for the criminal justice council to say, you know, th- these are the appropriate folks who actually need the hours of training. We're not going to require 16 hours for every single law enforcement officer in the state the way the statute uh, does right now, which they're not even achieving now. We're sort of acknowledging reality in a lot of what we're doing in this bill. (laughs) So um, yeah, I just wanted to allay any concern you had that we're looking at a mandated number of hours total for all training uh, on that, you know, biennial review that you all have to do. Yeah, I mean, that'd be great if if there was no um, set hours and you're right, if it was more of a based on uh, your proficiency, maybe the hours come down, maybe they go up. If you're not proficient, that makes more sense, right? I mean, if somebody takes t- longer to do something to become proficient, then it makes sense that that's the way it is. And if you're better, more proficient at it, you have experts in some areas or better in some areas, then maybe it takes less hours. The question is then, how, what is the gauge? Uh, and that's something I'm not sure how we're going to, how they're going to put that out. If it's, if it's all just a written test or if it's a um, proficiency test, and that's going to be the challenge. Representative Hankins. Thank you. And again, is that proficiency, um, is that challenge a staffing and scheduling challenge for you? Is that your concern? 
and who does it so if it's a written test right um that's pretty easy i mean the the system will will either pass you or fail you but if it's a proficiency test who who is the one that's given that test that's certified or are capable of giving that test in a way that's not going to be challenged by either the employee that may or may not p pass it or liability wise if somebody says did they in fact really pass it or did you just push them through to make you know to check that box as far as saying they're good um I don't know. And if it comes down to now they have to go to the academy to be found proficient, that becomes a staffing and a budgetary problem. Thank you. Well, Chief, thank you for, I know that your time is really limited. So I'm wondering if anybody has any other burning questions for the chief or if there's anything you want to leave us with as we continue working on this. And this will not be the last time I think that we're uh, talking about law enforcement training uh, in this biennium, but. So I would just leave that. I appreciate the time, by the way, but I think the proficiency tests, that one thing I would think about is, is there any way they can do satellite if they're going to get to that? And that proficiency means going to the academy. And this has been talked about for my 20 plus years is, is there a way they can set up a northern area, a northeastern, northwestern, southeastern, southwestern days so that every agency doesn't have to travel to meet down there, you know, you know, once a month they can do it in different locations just to save every little agency some time and money. That's the only thing I would throw out there. We've had a statutory requirement um, that uh, the Criminal Justice Council will work to adopt uh, alternate routes to certification. And one of the things this bill does is push out the timeline to adopt final rules that would allow for that kind of flexibility, satellite campuses, some synchronous uh, remote learning for some of the sort of classroom coursework, et cetera. Um, so it pushes it out. But the idea is that we're endorsing the three-year plan that the governor recommended the, uh, and that the CJC has been working on with the Department of Public Safety on some of that. Um, I know you're, you're aware that uh, there's an attempt to, to try to tease out easier ways for folks to get the coursework done that they need um, than to just go to the academy. Uh, it sounds like you're endorsing the plan. Probably wish it could happen faster if I, <laughs> if I was going to guess. Yep, good. Perfect. I appreciate it. Well, Chief, thank you so much. Uh, feel free to stick around if you want to, but I, I know it sounds like you had a couple of pretty serious cases you were working on. <laughs> we do. I, I appreciate your uh, the time and the, and the bill. Uh, let me have me give me the ability to talk to all of you. Thanks for being with us. Have a good day. Um, so uh, I am just going to make sure we're getting this revised draft with this one extra little line in it posted. Uh, yes, it is posted. Okay, draft 3.1 is up. Um, the last person that I wanted to have uh, come and speak with us is uh, Karen Transgard Scott from the network. And how are you? I'm very well, Chair McCarthy. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, good, good afternoon, committee members. For the record, I'm Karen Transgard Scott and I'm the Executive Director at the Vermont Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. I'm uh, here today to speak in support of the changes uh, that are proposed by the Criminal Justice Council. We're heartened to um, be able to be working with them. We think that this is the exact pathway forward to improve the relationship between law enforcement officers uh, who are investigating domestic and sexual violence cases and the victims of those crimes. We see that, um, you know, I've been around for a really long time. And uh, back in 2009, I was the director at the network when we thought that the best way to move forward would be to seek uh, uh, statutory language that uh, established mandatory training on domestic and sexual violence. Two hours of training every two years. Train The training was, uh, we helped devise the training. It's an online training officers sit in front of a computer. And as Chief Lamoth talked about, sometimes you have to wonder if anybody's actually listening to those trainings because it's tied to time. They just have to put in those two hours with the computer on. Uh, we, we've been working with the police academy uh, and the criminal, uh, the criminal Justice Council to create a, a training that not only is skills and competency based, but also recognizes differential roles within the law enforcement community. So currently, the colonel of the state police and the fresh cadet all get the same mandatory training on domestic and sexual violence. And so we're working with the Criminal um, Justice Council to create training that offers uh, training 
on competency and skill building specific to roles. So that so people in officers and executive um, positions would get a different training or uh, you know markedly similar but different training to uh, to um, in community leaders to uh, the folks that are out there driving cars and uh, directly responding to situations and cadets. So we think that this is, we think that actually this is an incredible opportunity for um, Vermont to really change the way that we're training our law enforcement officers in relationship to domestic and sexual violence. I also just wanna say that we, um, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a new newer appointee on the Criminal Justice Council. I was appointed two years ago. I've been doing this work on domestic and sexual violence for 31 years. 16 years as the executive director of the Vermont Network. The new Criminal Justice Council is about 50% community members like myself and 50% law enforcement officers. And there's a terrific level of respect and collaboration that exists within that council. Um, I, I was uh, interested to hear the issues that um, Chief Lamoth brought up. I've heard those very same issues being discussed at council meetings where we are working to not only improve systems and, and improve um, what happens out in the field, but also to provide different kinds of supports for law enforcement officers so that the community experience is different. And, um, and I believe that it's been my experience that the Criminal Justice Council models that experience where there's just so much respect and so much consideration given for both the, the, the challenges of running a law enforcement uh, agency, as well as the goals that we have for policing in our state. So I'm happy to answer any questions about our position or, or anything else. And thank you for uh, your service on the Criminal Justice Council and, uh, and kind of endorsing this move and to help inform it. Um, are there questions that the committee has for Karen? One of the questions I have is, um, we've talked today a lot about the evolution from a specific required number of hours to demonstration of competency. And the, you know, we're going back to things like in 2018, uh, what we were requiring versus today. Um, in your years of working on these issues, you know, is this, are we kind of starting to arrive at a place where we're embracing models that you think will work better and get away from the, the kind of, I don't know, just, just trying to fight against the cultural momentum in law enforcement training by requiring a number of hours? Yeah, I, you know, I really appreciate that, that question, Chair McCarthy. I, again, I've been around for a really long time uh, and at no time in my history here in Vermont, have we ever had these kinds of conversations with relationship to how we train law enforcement officers? You know, we did a survey of our member organizations. We represent 15 nonprofits that provide direct services to victims of domestic and sexual violence. And we surveyed them earlier this year, asked them what would be the most important things for law enforcement officers to know from the perspective of crime victims about their interaction, ask them what, what they wished for when a police officer arrived at a domestic or sexual violence scene, what, did, what was the wish that would happen? And what are the barriers for people calling the police? And uniformly across the state, what we heard over and over again was people don't call the police because they're afraid they won't be treated with respect. We wish that police officers knew more about domestic violence and sexual assault so they, so they would understand what's happening in that moment and be able to treat victims with respect. And I'm not impugning uh, law or law enforcement officers. Uh, hundred, uh, for, for the most part, they do an incredible job when they respond, respond to a domestic violence. But we actually believe a different kind of training that not only speaks to um, absorbing information, but also creates the kind of adult learning that we know to be best practice, where, the, where folks are absorbing information and then they're able to test out their skills and competencies through the course of the training to, to see where it's landing and to understand uh, what, what exactly is required of folks. We think that if we can do that kind of training, we will never get those kinds of responses from survivors going forward. That that kind of, that interaction, that in that, in that the, you know, the, the <laughs> tensest moment, will actually be vastly improved. So, um, so we think we're, we're, we're on the right track here. And uh, we are so proud of our Criminal Justice Council and our Police Academy. It's been 
an honor to serve on that committee. I, I'm also on the professional regulation committee, so I have, you know, front row seat to um, to what happens when officers don't have the the support and training that they need in those very tense situations. Um, we have a lot of hope moving forward. You know, the Vermont Network was recently, um, we've been recently called on to develop a national uh, training center on gender-based violence. And to do that, we wanted to make sure that we were including the kinds of trainings and the kinds of partnerships that we're seeing at the Criminal Justice Council today. So we asked the Police Academy to, Academy to sign on as a primary partner in that work. And we're working very closely with them to not only develop training that is applicable to police officers, but also to develop training uh, that's applicable to the advocates that are that are helping people in the community so that we have a much closer relationship and can do a better job on both sides of that equation in um, making sure that survivors get, uh, get their needs met and that we're improving community safety at, at every opportunity. Well, thanks for being with us today, Karen. Uh, any questions for Karen before we take a look at the updated draft? Well, thanks for being with us. We're gonna take a look at the latest and greatest version of the bill now and uh, I'm gonna invite Attorney Devlin to come back on the Zoom. Thanks for being with us, Karen. Thank and you so much. Thank you for your work on this and all the other things you're all doing. <laughs> take care. All right, uh, so Tim, I think we've all got uh, draft 3.1. One o'clock timestamp. Or the one o'clock timestamp. Yes, that is the correct draft. Thank you very much for having me back. Um, Chair McCarthy, again, for the record, my name is Tim Devlin, Legislative Counsel. Um, draft 3.1 has the inclusion of just one new sentence that can be found on page two in section one, line seven. And this is updates the text to the uh, session law um, pertaining to the purpose of the bill. The entire section will now read starting on line five, the purpose of this act in part is in part to amend the laws of Vermont regarding law enforcement officer training to emphasize achieving increased competency over prescribed minimum hours of training in fair and impartial policing. This is the new sentence. The change to a focus on skills and competency is meant to align with the goals of the increasing of increasing transparency and accountability to historically stigmatized communities. The committee, that was my, uh, after listening to the wise words of Dr. Um, this right in Longo, I uh, tried to transcribe what he had said to us because what he said in his initial testimony was so great. <laughs> so um, I hope that that, uh, that works for the committee. All right. All right, let's keep moving. So uh, Tim, I think if you could uh, just give us a walk through um, just to see if there are any flags before we move the this draft of the bill. Sorry, I'd be more than happy to. Thank you. Moving on um, from section one to section two. And again, just for context, we are in the part of the bill pertaining to fair and impartial policing training, uh, as well as advanced roadside impaired driving enforcement training. Both are found in the same area of statutes. And so <clears throat> that's why both topics are in one part. Section two, um, <laughs> removes, um, as was discussed earlier on line 19 and 20, um, some ambiguous language um, pertaining to a fixed number of hours for required training. The next part of amended law will appear on the top of page three, <laughs> under section three of the same section. And this designates <clears throat> Sorry, this adds language. Excuse me, one moment. Okay. Sorry for that. Um, this uh, new language on line four and five of page three 
um, echoes the uh, sentiment that was in the policy, um, or sorry, the purpose section above. And in, or I think it's just easier for me to read it out loud, in order to remain certified, a law enforcement officer shall receive a refresher course in the training required by the subsection during every odd number year and a program approved by the Vermont Criminal Justice Council designed to demonstrate achieve law enforcement officer competency in fair and impartial policing. Subsection F, sorry, on line seven, which has been removed here, uh, uh, dissolves the fixed hour requirement for the advanced roadside impaired driving enforcement training. And that is being transitioned into um, a rulemaking authority for the uh, Vermont Criminal Justice Council to adopt uh, via rule um, at a later point in time. Section three <clears throat> pertains to the fair and impartial policing training report. This um, will require a report back um, on or before January 15th, 2024 by the Vermont Criminal Justice Council to both the House um, Committee on Government Operations and Military Affairs and the Senate Committee on Government Operations. In particular, on its efforts to update and implement the fair and partial policing training, and also the point of whether the integrity of the training standards have been maintained in this transition. Well, the moving on to section four, at the top of page four, we have council powers and duties referring to the Vermont Criminal Justice Council. In here under uh, the amended Title 20 VSA, Section 2355, Subdivision A13, you'll find um, a rulemaking authority granted to the council to <coughs> promulgate rules and training requirements for that advanced roadside impaired driving enforcement um, training that was uh, mentioned above. The next part of the bill, beginning on line 10 of page 4, pertains to roadside stop data collection. Here in section five, um, which amends title 20 VSA 2366, that is a section that's titled law enforcement agencies, fair and impartial policing policy and race data collection. Subdivision E, um, which states on or before September 1st, 2014, Every state, county, and, um, and municipality law enforcement agency shall collect roadside data, stop data, consisting of the following. And two new categories are added, or sorry, one new category is added, requiring that the date, time, and location of the stop be included in that proffered information. The next section, <laughs> sorry, the next part of the bill pertains to the duty to contact current or former agencies when hiring law enforcement officers. In particular, section six, beginning on line nine of page five, amends title 20 VSA section 2362A, not only taking, uh, changing the title, which will now read uh, potential hiring agency, duty to contact current or former agencies, will also um, require that when hiring a new officer, um, instead of just contacting the latest employ, uh, employer of that officer, they go back to look at all previous employers um, to the extent that those previous employers are law enforcement agencies. And if you'd like, I can read through that particular language, uh, Chair McCarthy. I think we've been through that a couple of times. Um, it's pretty straightforward. I mean, I'm seeing nodding heads, so unless anybody has an objection, we'll, we will not torture you with having to read that to us again. <laughs> the... Next part of the bill pertains to the rule adoption deadline modification. Specifically, this repeals a previous de uh, deadline and um, pushes it out to July 1st, 2025 for the Vermont Criminal Justice Council to adopt rules regarding alternate routes to the certification required by uh, Title 20 VSA Section 2355A1. And the final uh, part of the bill is the effective date, which shall take effect upon passage. Tim Representative Higley has a question. Yeah, Tim, this is maybe not a big deal, but again, under the uh, rule adoption deadline, I don't know as I've ever seen it uh, referred to that the uh, uh, Criminal Justice Council shall finally adopt the rules. Usually it just makes reference to 
you know, whatever entity it is, shall adopt rules. I don't, I don't know as long yeah. I've seen shall finally mm -hmm. adopt the rules. So, uh, finally, no, I, yeah. Is a, or is a shall adopt rules, yeah. No, that's a great point, uh, Representative. There's a, not a preliminary rule or final rule, uh, as I understand it. So I can certainly remove the term finally to provide. Did, that, did that language come from the original section that was being repealed in section seven? Um, I'd have to check. It may have. Okay. That may have crept in as well. I don't know. It just kind of sounds like somebody's being scolded for not doing their homework. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> you will, John. So, yeah. So, so we would like, so uh, we should do a quick edit on that. So I, I, I agree, Representative Higley. So we wanted to say, I think, on or before July 1st, 2025, the Criminal Justice Council shall adopt rules regarding alternate routes to certification required by it. Okay. I am making that edit now, and I will send a new draft to the committee in a few minutes. Okay, great. So committee, let's take uh, just a 10 minute break here and we should now have um, draft 3.2 with a timestamp of 1.45 PM up there at the bottom under Tim's name. Right there at the last page with this change, right? Yes. And sorry, again, for the record, my name is Tim Devlin, Legislative Council. The change uh, made in draft 3.2 will appear, well, it won't really appear because it's an omission, but it reads across uh, lines 14 and 16. And it will now read um, section eight rule adoption deadline on or before July 1st, 2025, the Vermont Criminal Justice Council shall adopt the rules regarding alternative routes to the certification required by 20 VSA section 2355A1. And so because it's on or before, if they wanna adopt those rules earlier, they have all the flexibility they need, right? We're not, yes. by removing that finally language, we're not tripping them up in any way. No, you're correct. Okay. All right. Any other questions for Mr. Devlin before we lose him to our Senate colleagues? All right. Tim, thank you for your hard work on this bill. And I uh, hope that you have a restful weekend and are feeling 100% better when we see you next week. <laughs> Thank you very much. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we're missing Mr. Hooper and Mr. Morowicki and Mr. Byron here. And it is now five of. So um, let's just relax for a minute now and see if I can scoop up our colleagues from the hallway. While you're doing that, I'm going to run the next door to approach right quick.